morning, everybody. Thanks for coming to this, and thanks for giving us the stage with such a prestigious group of people. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm the Learning Participation Manager of Sound. I've only worked there for the last um, two or three. This is my third festival, and as you can see from our dates, we've, we've only got about a month to go, so it's quite busy at the moment. Um, I should also maybe caveat, I'm not a composer, but I did train as a musician. The only keyboard I play these days is the computer one, um, but I do have a 20 plus career, year career uh, in the arts, um, working places like uh, the Royal Albert Hall in London, where Duncan Chapman and I famously did a gig for the Queen, <laughs> and uh, latterly uh, the Royal Scottish National Orchestra, and now I've, I've seemed to be progressing further north as my career goes, and, 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 and I'm now in, um, well actually I'm not based in Aberdeen, but I have worked for sound. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about um, targeting new audiences. Um, Sorry, the clicker doesn't work, so I'm going to keep talking back. Um, so, um, Lee's just mentioned a little bit, just to give you a little background of sound. Before Sound Festival, people who lived in Aberdeen had to um, travel to the Fletcher Belt in, in Edinburgh and Glasgow if they wanted to go and see anything new music -y or vaguely interesting. And that was a sort of two and a half, three hour train ride away and involved an overnight stay. And they got a bit fed up with doing this. So, Pete Stollery and a few other prominent local musicians got together. And in 2004, produced a, a pilot festival called Upbeat. Um, it featured um, Graham Fitkin, Ruth Wall, Ensemble Bash, uh, etc. Um, and it went, it was um, really successful. So a year later, in 2005, renamed to Sound, um, the inaugural festival took place, and we've now become one of Scotland's major new music organisations. So a few numbers: um, 13 festivals, nearly a thousand events, 500 workshop uh, education stuff, obviously. Lots of commissions and uh, lots of people, which is impressive because there aren't a huge amount of people over here. And if <laughs> any of you, <laughs> if any of you um, are arts admin data geeks, but maybe maybe you guys aren't. <laughs> but if you want to know some of our statistics, um, this just gives you a very brief overview of how we've grown the audience. We're over seven thousand. Um, a lot of our audience is local, which is important, I think, and good. But we do have a lot from the rest of Scotland and elsewhere. And of the people who do come to us from outside, ninety percent travel specifically to attend the festival, which is great from an economic impact point of view, as mm. we can tell, all the local companies, etc. Um, we have a roughly fifty-fifty female male split of audience members. And then interestingly, actually, we do have a, a, rate, a sort of fairly standard mix of all the different age brackets, roughly around 20% for each. The, the 24 to 35 age bracket is definitely less, um, and the 65 plus is definitely more, but roughly speaking, they're all roughly around the same. Um, we do know that about 28% come to us um, and experience a new music event for the first time through our festival. Um, and yeah. We've managed to raise a lot more. Fiona Robertson, our director, who's incredible, has raised lots of money and we work with loads of different people, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. So, um, where are we? Um, I think it's really important to see sound in a, in a geographical context. Being on the margins actually, I think, strengthens our need and our wish to collaborate and participate. I think the very why, what and how of what we do is really linked to our unique flow, uh, our position. And we have actually managed to nurture new music making outside of the central belt of Scotland, where the majority of it happens, and really make a name for the northeast of Scotland as a, as a new music hub. So our geography contains a major city, major for Scotland that is, <laughs> it's not a huge city, but it's the third biggest city in Scotland, and a vast rural area. So Aberdeenshire is probably about four times the size of London, but with a sixteenth of the population, so it is sparse. There are about six to eight principal towns that are only home to about ten to 20,000 people. Um, the circles are where we have been recently, where I've been personally, um, and a lot of the bits in between, there isn't anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so I honestly, when I worked for the RSNO, a chief executive who shall remain nameless, there was a big map of Scotland, and he said, oh, why don't you do anything up there? And I went, well, because it's the Cairngorms, it's the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, some of our programming sort of principles and models, we really do put audiences in the heart of what we do. I'm going to talk a little bit about our artistic themes, our flexibility, 
Our partnerships, and that's a really long slide and doesn't have any pictures on it because there's so many of them. Obviously, our learning and participation, and finally, being embedded, which um, is what we are. Um, so, our artistic themes. Um, so, we we are genuinely really passionate and enjoy new music, and that's really important. And we just want people to create it, develop it, perform it, listen to it, and learn about it. And I think one of our main artistic principles is just to present a really diverse programme. Um, if we didn't, people in the North East just wouldn't hear this kind of music. So we have absolutely no sort of preferences within the new music sphere or world. And we just try and bring up as much variety as possible. Um, and some of it can be quite hardcore um, and some of it less so, but we don't necessarily place anything on a higher agenda than anything else. Um, we work and involve local people and composers, Scottish people and composers and performers, but we also draw upon fairly leading international figures where we can, including the fabulous bassoonist Pascal Galois, who came up to us and spent uh, quite a few days with us last year and was incredibly inspiring. Um, every year we commission loads of new works and co-commission, and not only does this obviously give employment to composers, which is really important. It keeps the sector alive and it keeps our festival really up to date and fresh. So every year you'll hear lots of new things. Sometimes we just let people write a piece and do what they want to do. Other times we're very specific about how we curate and how we commission those pieces. Um, so, and, and quite a lot of them have a kind of community focus or background in mind. So uh, for example, this year we, uh, we commissioned someone to write viola pieces for a massive viola ensemble mm -hmm. not just for professionals they've got to be able to do it with open strings as well because we're having a day where loads of people can come and we want people who are beginner viola players along to play with alongside professionals but they need to be able to play something so open strings it is <laughs> um so and then another example would be um so for example this year uh, kate house is playing a, a program of piano works with electronic, live electronics and piano, and she's not quite got enough repertoire for a full length gig. So we commissioned two Scottish female composers to just add to that. So, you know, we're, we're constantly sort of crafting behind the scenes, or Fiona is, at just making sure that, um, you know, there's, there's well-balanced programmes, but artists can bring a full programme or, or they can change it with us. Um, and we're currently actually, nurturing composers is a really important part of what, of what we do. We're currently on a massive programme run, uh, funded by the PRSF, which is called Sound Creators, which is basically uh, nurturing composers and workshopping lots of ideas with them. We have a composer in residence who, up to the last three years, was John DeSimone, um, and we just appointed Ailey Robertson as our new composer in residence. And I think the great thing about having a composer in residence is they're a visible presence in the town and in the community. So for the last three years, as well as doing big commissions, John's got his final piece this year being performed by Clang, um, who he knows very well and has worked with when he studied with them. Um, but he's also running our composers course for teenagers. He's also doing talks. He's also doing our monthly composition things. And in fact, his last commission for the festival is to write a piece for flexible ensemble for the Aberdeenshire Youth Orchestra, which will be uh, played next year. We don't actually know what the scoring is going to be yet because they haven't done the auditions for the, for the orchestra. It does vary from year to year, as all of those of you who work, know who work in youth settings, you know, they've some some years they'll have, you know, I don't know, ten flute players, and next year they'll only have three. So when we find out what the outcome of the auditions is, we'll be able to give them a scoring, and he'll be able to write that piece. But the interesting thing about that is because he's been working with young people, talking them through some of his compositions, where he gets his inspiration from, how he writes, he's actually going to blog about it. So hopefully, <laughs> if I can actually get in to write it um, he will <laughs> talk them through the process of writing it and then they'll get to play his piece at the end so and I and that for those young people I know will be a really in, in, inspiring experience um, we do have themes for the festival um, themes can be a curse and a blessing in equal measures I think uh, but latterly I think they've worked quite well I mean I'll give you an example um, last year we did a theme on operas and um, it started way back in the summer before the festival when Aberdeen were running uh, a weekend of um, events that celebrated the history and heritage of Aberdeen. So we commissioned three local, well two local composers to write an opera 
based on historical figures from Aberdeen. <laughs> and um, one included, um, oh, one was about witchcraft, which was written by Joe Stollery, Pete Stollery's son. And the other was about the Jacobean Uprising. I don't know my Scottish history, so I can't quite remember the details. And then we also commissioned Erilyn Wallen, who wrote, who's done a lot of work with Tete Tete Opera. So she wrote a fabulous um, four minute, two, you know, four minute opera on a nasty <laughs> master harbour who crashed a boat into Aberdeen Harbour. And we actually performed the pop-up opera actually at the spot where it actually happened. And Erilyn was able to mentor Philip Cook, who is a lecturer and composer at the University of St Andrews and, uh, sorry, not St Andrews, oh, Aberdeen, Aberdeen, sorry, and um, <laughs> work with Joe Stollery and actually mentor them through writing these short operas. Um, and actually it was quite funny with Erilyn's one because one of the one of the singers got really into the role and actually climbed over the fence the, uh, at the end of the harbour and sparked a kind of emergency <laughs> rescue operation. So he got really into the role of being this nasty harbour master and before we knew it, the rescue boat was there and the police turned up and they put someone trying to jump off the side of the harbour. Not quite the publicity we were looking for, but <laughs> publicity is good publicity. Um, and then we redid those operas in the festival. We popped them up in all kinds of random places. Um, and so that just sort of gives you a flavour of some of the Queen's stuff. And also I should add, the performers for those were mostly young professionals, either living and working in Aberdeen or studying in Aberdeen and or studying in Glasgow. So it was a performance um, employment opportunity for young artists as well as working with young composers and then formed part of our um, programme. Um, what else am I going to say? So we've done an endangered uh, an endangered instruments theme we're doing for the next five years, which has proven to be hugely popular. Last year we focused on the bassoon. This year it's the violas, as I've already mentioned, hence Pascal. And we had a local bassoonist, Leslie Wilson, who was principal bassoon for the RSNO for years. She uh, ended up doing a lot of our work and we commissioned quite a few people. To, well, first of all, we hunted around and found out how many bassoonists of decent quality there were in the area. It was eight, turns out to be. These included teachers, professionals, you know, really, really good amateurs. And we commissioned, including Pete, and in fact his piece for eight bassoons, as it ended up being, was played just last night again. We ended up commissioning these people to write for eight bassoons. But had there only been five bassoon players, it would have been right for five bassoon players. Had there been nine or 15, which would have been a miracle, it would have been right for 15. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is what I mean about the sort of flexibility with the programme. Um, and, and really making sure that we're working with local people. And also within the festival, we, we really do target family audiences as well. We have a um, programme where we do a promenade concert in the local Maritime Museum, and there's three performances and people get to wander around. And they're not necessarily of dumbed down and easy pieces. They're just three um, you know interesting pieces within the programme that families go and watch. Um, and in fact, this year, I'm taking... James Turnbull, oboe player, up to Banff Castle with a whale researcher from the University of St Andrews, which is where I live, which is why I sit Oh, you down there. <laughs> that's, that's a trek. Everyone. Yeah, it is. It's going to be a long day. But we're taking... <laughs> James is going to play Emily Doolittle's piece, Social Sounds of Whales at Night, which is actually um, as a result of scientific um, research that Luke has been doing, this ac whale researcher academic, on how whales speak to each other. Emily, who is really interested in the science of all of it, wrote this amazing piece, Social Sounds of Wales at Night. So Luke and I are going to go and run a workshop for families in Banff, which is right up on the north north coast, talk to them about how whales talk to each other, and then and then James is going to play this piece. So that's just a bit of an example of some of our programming. Um, yeah, flexibility. I think we had a flexible festival model back in 2005, and that hasn't changed. The festival's been as long as five weeks, thankfully not when I was working for them. <laughs> it's now as short as 10 days. Um, we evaluate every year and sort of change what we do and are really responsive. So this year actually we've condensed to 10 days. We don't necessarily have a 7.30 concert programme, we do a series of lunch times and then we have a 6 o'clock and 8 o'clock and a 10 o'clock. Um, and our concerts are generally quite short and usually involve a pre or a post discussion with somebody so you're, you're getting to see people fairly up close our pricing strategy reflects this doesn't necessarily make the most economically beneficial festival but you know pretty much for 11 quid or under or for free you can come and see a lot of our events 
um, we totally don't think of venues in the traditional sense. Somebody was talking about this yesterday, I, I forget who. For us, it's partly because there aren't any or there aren't <laughs> enough to cope with the get-ins and the rehearsal times and some of the tech spec up, set up for some of the stuff that we do. So you will find us in weird and wonderful places. Lighthouses, aquariums, shopping centres, flash mobs and cafes, bars, bookshops, science centres, village halls, woods, forests, you name it, we've got it. So partnerships. <laughs> this isn't even everyone we work with. And I think a really, really important part of what we do is working in partnership. I think when you're in a, in a small community, you just can't go against other people. You have to just work with them. And that's a real testament to Fiona, our festival director. So, um, and actually this helps for audience development as well, not just for um, sort of, you know, people to work with professionally. When we started back in 2005, we hooked up with all the other classical music promoters in the area and asked them to programme a piece of mu new music within their existing uh, series. So this included the university, um, a couple of, you know, your traditional promoting societies. There was a, a lunchtime series that another person used to do, an organ series. Um, and over the years, you know, their audience has embraced new music, partly because they found them interesting and different to what they often get. And they do cross over and come and see some of the other things we do. Obviously, they're an existing audience and not a new audience, but they were a really key part in the early days, I think, of um, getting Sounds brand recognised amongst the arts community. These days, I have to say, they don't come to us for ideas. They all programme completely new music concerts of their own that fall within our festival period. Some of them even commission their own works, again, without even asking us for advice. So I think, you know, over the 10 years or 13 years that we've been in existence, they've really enjoyed getting to know and the benefits of working with composers and commissioning. So that's been a huge um, success. We've also done that with other promoters. So we've crossed over with jazz and traditional jazz at the Blue Lamp at the Lemon Tree in Aberdeen. Again, there's always a kind of crossover jazz event during the festival and you know they, they often do their own thing. We also um, develop that within the traditional folk music scene in Trad as before in Scotland. Um, and, and again, quite a lot of those artists who are Trad or working in those uh, environments and other music genres I use for my education work. So again, it's a kind of another crossover between um, performers. So yeah, we work with about loads of local organisations. Aberdeen Festivals Network, that's another really strong thing about Aberdeen. There's about 12 festivals uniquely placed across the year and we try and um, cross over and work with all of them during their festivals and likewise then with us. Um, and in fact, just last week there was Tech Fest uh, in Aberdeen, and we supported a performance by the Birmingham Ensemble for Electroacoustic Research. Yeah, <laughs> who uh, who had a piece um, that was connecting data streams from the Hadron Collider. Um, and I'm gutted I missed it actually, but it was our role was to connect the artists, bring the musicians together, and help Tech Fest develop the event. So, an example of how we work in partnership. Um, Red Note, a uh, new music ensemble, Scottish, the Scottish New Music Ensemble um, is our ensemble and association, so we work with them on loads of projects and uh, education work. We also work with the Royal Conservatory <coughs> of Scotland. We have a great international network. <coughs> We're twinned with the French town of clermont ferrand who also promote a new music festival. And over the years, we have a lot of exchange between artists, between the two towns. It's been hugely successful. And together with Sound and Music, we've worked on Composer's Kitchen with the Zini Quartet actually having a retreat programme, working with Canadian and Scottish composers on a retreat here and then over there, and then they've had a festival performance. And partly how that sort of thing translates into audience development is because they're based in one of our venues in Vancouver called The Barn, and their, their, their retreat is um, workshopping and playing ideas. So when the local community come into this venue to use the cafe, they're hearing what's going on, they're seeing them, and then they get to see them in the festival and, and they're just part of that sort of local community for that, that sort of short space of time. How am I doing for time? I'm about five. Right. <laughs> Good um, timing of the I'll, question. <laughs> I'll, well, the Learning and Participation Programme is sort of, it, it sort of runs through everything we do. I mean, it's what I do for the organisation. It's what I've spent my, my career doing. So we do, we run a programme called Get Composing, which is um, uh, getting young people doing composition workshops and uh, residentials and they get to get a piece played by Red Note Ensemble, it's just a couple of things we do. Composition CBDs for teachers, um, we've had, we've, with Pete actually, because there's been a change in the way music composition has been graded in Scotland, it's a different education system. 
So we've been doing a lot of work with teachers recently, Sound Collectives project I run that works with young people from regeneration areas, so from really deprived backgrounds, and that's really hard work, getting them to actually come out and do stuff. But we're working with Tinderbox Collective based in Edinburgh, a fantastic organisation who have this thing. They just have a, an orchestra, and it's lots of different parts in the orchestra. It's not your, or, your traditional orchestral setup. They'll have a, a rhythm section, or it'll be a jazz setup, or they'll have vocals. But So we're working with them to try and sort of nurture. And if that goes well, we've, in theory, got a gig at the... Um, the reopening of the Aberdeen Music Hall in December, and if that goes well, they'll get a performance slot next year. Uh, rural residencies, we're trying to do, as I've said, we try and work in rural areas, so I'm out and about doing all kinds of things uh, in rural places. I've mentioned the Youth Orchestra Commission, GAT, the Grampian Hospital Arts Trust. Um, Aberdeen Royal Infirmary has this amazing space called the City Arts Space, and you'll often find some of our projects there. And um, it's a kind of gallery space, but we had installations in there and exhibitions. And in fact, I'm just working with them at the moment on a project, hopefully for Ailey Robertson, our composing residence about bedside composition, working with people in hospitals. Um, oh, singing families, school-based work, all the usual stuff. <laughs> usual, not everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> usual for us, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I'm in school all the time and um, you know, I was, it was really interesting listening to a couple of the more school-focused uh, talks from yesterday because all the things they were saying, I could totally nod my head and uh, agree with. I think there's a real confidence issue with young people today mm. about how they interact with music and their, their confidence to make musical decisions, whether they've got a musical background or not, because the majority of the ones we work with, even though they're doing NAT5 equivalent of sort of GCSE 16, 15, 16 age range for, for music, and they have to do composition they really are not sure of themselves they're not sure of their you know what they want to do what they're trying to say or what they're trying to express and that yeah I, that's another subject to go on about music in schools um this picture i was going to talk to you about some of the pictures but um because one of the other pictures we had earlier on it, again that was mentioned yesterday was the um sonic arts network uh musical sonic uh, postcards project what was it called yeah sonic, sonic postcards. postcards yeah we just did that last year um, up in rural Aberdeenshire with Pippa Murphy, who was one of the original oh, composers great. on that project. Yeah, yeah. so she works with us regularly. Um, and that was, we often do a music and technology project in a primary school in some really rural schools. And when I say rural, I mean like 18 children in the entire school. Um, <laughs> and they're, they're just, they're really tiny. Mm -hmm. So the picture at the top is Leslie Wilson, our fabulous um, uh, bassoon player from last year. And that's actually Ben, uh, a local resident who is the bassoon, it's also called his son. <laughs> but um, the thing about Leslie and involving her in the festival last year as bassoonist and all the work that we did, her and a couple of other people said, you know, said to, said to us, we are starting a new music ensemble. We just want to do it ourselves because we love, we've loved doing so much new music. So they have set up their own musical ensemble. It's called the North East New Music Ensemble. N E N N E, otherwise known as Any Enemy, <laughs> called it, and uh, um, they they so they set themselves up, and it's a very random orchestration. So we put out a call on Facebook and said, "Oh, guess what, everybody? There's this new musical ensemble that we started. Can you score for X Y Z?" And a few composers said, "Oh, yeah, I can rearrange that. Oh, I've got a piece that will just about work with that. I'll just shift that around and stuff." So they've got a gig in the festival, and that's going really well. But aside from that, there's a second ensemble. <laughs> set up called Karios, which has been sort of um, set up through the university, sort of unbeknownst to us, who've also got a gig in the festival, run by another local sort of university-based composer. So, you know, these people are, there's a kind of cyclical thing going on here. So we feel like, as a result of all this work, we are incredibly embedded in our local community. We know it well, and they know us, and I cannot stress the importance of getting out and about and talking to people. Find out who you've got on your doorstep how you can engage and work with them and, and what they're into and I think that's been a real success of sound over the last um, few years and it's kind of slightly snowballing so to sort of summarize involving the local musicians in the high level project so Leslie was on stage with Pascal she played in the, the Benedict Mason Red Note gig which is one of the hardest pieces I mean just unbelievably difficult um, but you know and, and and lots of people came to support her because they know her personally or they're they're pupils of hers, or they go to the same swimming pool as her, I don't know. They wanted to support her, so that's really important. Long-term partnerships and creative projects, I've talked a lot about partnerships. We really do work with people, and actually we find 
But the least successful gigs for sound, interestingly, are the helicoptering in, not even staying 24 hours in the region and then going away again. They're the gigs that don't actually work as well. The ones that work better are the ones that are embedded in the local community. Um, yeah, and I'll just finish by saying, um, one of the most successful things we did last year, which we're repeating this year, was a tour of Colin Vine's piece in place, which is basically a, a piece of, uh, I think it's a song cycle uh, about songs inspired by pieces in the, in the UK. And a couple of them are based on poetry from a Scottish poet. And we needed voices of local people with the right dialect who spoke Doric and had a very Northeast oh, accent. Uh -huh. So we sort of turned it into a little project. We sent um, we asked some schools, some kids in schools, it's a bit like the Sonic Postcards project, we asked some kids to write some words about their place and what it meant to them. And we went out and we recorded some of these local people with their Doric and their, their very unique accents. And they were then used in the gig. And when that tour of that performance happened in their local village hall, which is in the middle of nowhere, it was packed to the rafters, full of loads of people, including the local farmers apparently. And um, people were so chuffed to hear their voice physically within that piece, but also to know that their words have been used to inspire that. And we did it in two or three places and it was the same everywhere. So we're repeating that again this year. And that's just, you know, not a huge amount of community engagement, actually. From my point of view, I just had to organize a couple of things. It really didn't take that much, but yet the benefit of just involving those people, giving them a place and a role within it was a huge, huge success. So I think I'll just finish on that note. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. I kind of alluded yesterday that there were going to be some presentations that put a tear in your eye. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the work they're doing there in the northeast of Scotland is, is just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, because there was the numbers on slide number three or so the number of things they're presenting, the number of workshops they've been holding uh, all over the place uh, is, is, is magic. And uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're an, you guys are an example to all of us. <laughs> so who has a question or something to ask to Ellie? Well, I know that was something she would, before uh, Sharon, you go, I know there was something else you were going to talk about. You want to talk about <coughs> music and disability a little bit. Yeah. You want to do that now? <laughs> That's question number one? Or I can do, yeah. Um, we, as part of our um, Sound Creators program, we are developing a strand that supports composers um, who've got vision or support needs. And the first target area that we're working with uh, is composers on the autism spectrum. Partly because there's a personal connection. Um, Pete Stollery, our chair, and a fabulous professor of electric music at Aberdeen University, son, is a composer, but he's also... Um, on the spectrum and it's been through commissioning and working with him that we've realized that you can't you know obviously we all know it anyway you just can't treat everyone the same and assume that they can work in the same way so we've had um, meetings with about five Scottish composers on the spectrum in the last six months um, and it's been fascinating talking to them about what does and doesn't work for them and obviously you know every person on the spectrum is different <laughs> so you can't just assume the box over here or they on the autism spectrum so they'll be xyz because actually as, as proved with our conversations and what i already know from working with people on the spectrum they're completely different and so little things like how you how you create a schedule how you create a rehearsal schedule how you deal with orchestration and what information you give them at the beginning of the process you cannot change it halfway through so joe's opera that we did last summer um he scored it and then I asked him to rescore it and he couldn't, so we had to stick with it, which is why we couldn't use it for pop-ups because there was nothing pop-up about it because it used electronics and keyboard and it didn't fit in the back of my minibus. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> yes, there's me driving around, right? Opera number one, I um, So yeah, so we couldn't use it, which was a real shame, but it was a real eye-opener about thinking through exactly what your endpoint is at the beginning of process so we're hoping to have a conference or, or or at least a sort of debate and exchange and that's our focus area and then we'll move on to other composers with other disabilities we already work we already work with composers who have other disabilities and we do work with drake drake scotland as well yes, you do. so yeah You're um quite, quite so many things i haven't said because i haven't had time but yeah um so i hope that answers that question <laughs> <laughs>
it, it, it points in the direction of yet another dimension of what you guys are up to. Sharon, you know. Yeah, just a quick question without um, meaning for you to reveal any military secrets or anything. Um, how about your funding and in what is your staff? Yeah, well, funnily enough, I wrote that down in my notes and forgot to say it. So it's a staff team of four, but titchy tiny. <coughs> so we have a director who's not full time. I'm two and a half days a week, a marketing manager who's three days a week, and a festival coordinator who's full time, the only full time member of staff. Mm -hmm. We're all women. Um, and our funding has been a hot debate of recent recently um, because Creative Scotland, who's our like arts council. your choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, quite. Creative Scotland, our arts council equivalent, have regular regularly funded organizations on a three-year cycle three years ago we applied for it and didn't or well, four years ago we applied for rfo status and didn't get it and this year last year we applied for rfo status and didn't get it again <laughs> along with a lot of other organizations who actually folded and went under i mean the iron is so the the state of the funding in in scotland is pretty dire at the moment and it's not a central government issue the scottish government who have actually increased funding in the arts. It's the way the pie's been cut up mm. by the funding body. It's been absolutely shocking the way it's been dealt with. In the, and the Scottish Government have these years of different subjects each year, and this year is the Year of Young People. And ironically, in the Year of Young People, I think it was Scottish Youth Theatre or Scottish... One of the youth organisations folded because they didn't get their RFO and they didn't get repeat funding. So we have to apply to the Open Fund every year, which is project funding year on year. So that's our, our biggest funder. We're also well supported by the two local authorities, Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Shire. We get funding from both of them each year, but on top of that, we also get other project funding. So the Year of Young People, I applied for Joe Stollery, who I mentioned, and his librettist to write another opera for children. So that project will be happening next year. And then Trust and Foundations. But our, our director, and to a certain extent me, I mean, you know, on two and a half days a week, have to fundraise for all of the projects that we do. So yeah, just the usual cohort, <laughs> trust and foundations, local authority, <laughs> and not a lot of support from Creative Scotland, which is really disheartening because we're not in the central belt and we're not working with, you know, we're working with people who just don't get access to this sort of thing. I'll just step off my soapbox. <laughs> no, no, well, well I mean, It's very frustrating. I think, I think we were pretty cut up last year at not getting RFO status. It was a big kick in the teeth. But, you know, we just pick ourselves back up and we get on and just carry on what we're doing, what we do, <laughs> and just to show them. <laughs> yeah, well, the economy is ever so slowly picking up, but more importantly, the director of Creative Scotland is gone. And we're Thank all very yeah. helpful I don't, I don't that mean things to are going to change because one person <laughs> could screw up the lives of a lot of people doing fantastic Rob, do, do you think, uh, I'm quite interested in the geography uh, of, of your age, do you think the takeover that you've seen is because there's less exposure, particularly with the remoteness, or do you think it's a cultural thing that they're just more open to things that are different? I think it's both. Mm. Interestingly, the Aberdeen audience is incredibly liberal. And I'm not the same. And yeah, yeah and it, no, it's pretty liberal be. and fairly... Um, like they'll come to things, but they just, uh, and so some of our audience come to stuff we do because nothing else happens, you know, they just don't get to go to other things. Um, but but also I think there's a curiosity of people, and, and they are quite a fairly open-minded group. I mean, Aberdeen's, Aberdeen Shire is fairly affluent, I mean, it's in the middle of nowhere, but generally speaking, it's a fairly affluent area, so I think people are fairly well-educated, and I, and I do think that helps um, as well. I think it's a bit of both. No, because the, the other thing I sort of think of is that uh, some of the remoteness also would be due to talent. So, um, you know, being remote as people like Milo or, or Ava is talking, who their, their isolation has room for, for strength and vulnerability. So do you find that when you're looking at uh, local people being, being involved? Yes, because there's a lot of, there's a quite a big artistic community in coastal and rural areas. I mean, often on the art, on the visual art side as well, but there's a lot of interesting people who, like, I mean, like Erilyn Wallen, who, half of living in London, has a has a lighthouse up near Strathy Point, which is not even on the North Aberdeenshire coast, it's on the northern coast of Scotland, because she just says she needs that space to go and work there. So so we, there are quite often, surprisingly, a lot of creative people living in the area. I mean, the town of Huntley um, has a, a project called Devon Arts, 
or Devon Projects, I think they're now called, and the town is the venue. And they run a lot of residencies and work with a lot of local people. So, you know, there's something about being in an inspiring location that does, um, you know, foster that kind of creativity and people. And, and, and so we do cross over with, you know, poets or visual artists or dancers or, you know, in some of the things we do. Ellen, thank you ever so much. That was great. Oh, I've got brochures here, by the way. Sorry, I just meant to say. Do you think I'm not? Thank you.